Hi everyone, it's lovely to see you. I'm Lorna and we are reading The Mystery of the Smuggler's Rake by Helen Moss and this is chapter 7, A Brand New Investigation. After tying Gemini up in the little inlet on the promontory, Scott, Jack, Emily and Drift returned to the lighthouse. But there they found a very grumpy Joe Gordon prowling around the guest lounge, so they ran up to the kitchen, threw together a packed lunch and headed straight back out again. They drifted up to the castle on the cliff top and settled down in the ruined tower that had served as their HQ in their very first case together. It was a good place to talk without being overheard and a great place to plan an investigation. Do you think the compass has been stolen? Jack snorted. Who by? A catfish burglar. He laughed at his own joke, but neither Scott nor Emily joined in. Em's right, Scott said seriously, is the only logical explanation. Emily opened her notebook on the flat boulder she used as a table. It was a lovely new notebook with a glossy crimson cover and a gold ribbon bookmark. She flicked past her diagrams of the rake and wrote Operation Compass as the top of a new page. She underlined it twice using a new gold pen she bought especially for the purpose. The familiar delicious excitement of a brand new investigation was starting to make up for the disappearance of the Pendragon Compass. Emily added the subheading, Suspects. Someone must have dived down to the wreck between the time that we left yesterday morning and first thing today when Joe and Kelly took the Couture group down, she stated. And it's got to be a trained scuba diver, Scott added. That should narrow things down a bit. Emily nodded. A pretty experienced scuba diver too. They must either have dived yesterday afternoon in those dangerous currents or before it was even properly light this morning. Jack looked up from inspecting his sandwich. In their haste to flee the lighthouse, they'd grabbed anything they could find in the cupboards. He took a bite. Not bad. Salami, ketchup and Nutella worked surprisingly well together. Yeah, but who even knew the Pendragon Compass was down there waiting to be nicked, he put in. Exactly, Scott said, grimacing at a tuna and banana baguette. Joe Gordon knew, Emily said, writing his name at the top of the list of the suspects. Jack laughed. But Joe was being paid to find the compass. Why would he steal it? It's obvious, Emily said, so he could sneak off and find the smuggler's hiding place and keep all the treasure for himself. Joe could have planted the toy compass there so everyone would think that Scott was just messing about. If Joe did it, he must be a world-class actor, Scott said. You could still see Joe Gordon's face contorted with anger and disappointment, like a teacher who had just found one of his brainiest pupils skipping school to hang out at the shopping mall. To dispel the image, he looked through an arrow slit in the thick stone wall. You could see the whole bay from up here, all the way to Pirate Cove. He even thought he could make out a dark shadow where the mermaid lay, but it might just have been the rocks below the waves. It could have been Kelly, I suppose, Emily mused, adding the camera woman's name to the list. Jack was starting to enjoy this investigation now that it was firmly on dry land. Whoever pinched the compass will have the map to the smuggler's hoard. We've got to stop them getting their hands on all the treasure before we do. We wouldn't get to keep the treasure, Emily explained. It belongs to the company that now owns the Pendragon estate. But they really wanted us to be the one to find the secret location after all these years. It'd be so maddening if someone else beats us to it. Scott sank down onto a pile of stones cushioned with long springy grass. I just went to find the compass to prove to Joe Gordon that I wasn't making it up. I can't bear him thinking I've been playing some pathetic prank. I mean, do I look like the kind of person who goes around putting Scooby-Doo compasses round skeletons' necks for laughs? Joe Gordon has questioned your honour, Jack declared in a theatrical voice. How dare he besmirch the illustrious name of Carter? He leapt up and stood posing as if on guard for a sword fight. We are the smuggling Carters of Cornwall and we will challenge the scurvy knave to a duel. Will you stop banging on about the smuggling Carters? Joe Scott grumbled. We're Londoners. We're more likely to be descended from street sweeping Carters of Walthamstow or the pie selling Carters of Brixton. But he couldn't help laughing as Jack swashbuckled his way round the tower. Jack's clowning around could be dead annoying at times, but right now it was cheering him up. He suddenly remembered how Jack had stuck up for him against Joe as well. Yeah, Jack wasn't a bad brother, really. Scott joined in the duel, allowing Jack to corner him against a crumbling stone pillar with the tip of his imaginary sword tickling Scott's ribs. Emily sighed. This was what passed for normal behaviour with Jack, but she could usually rely on Scott to focus on an investigation for more than five seconds. This was like working with a pair of hyperactive goldfish in a sugar rush. Drift wasn't helping matters by yelping excitedly and bouncing round the boy's legs. She studied her notebook again. 
So far, there were only two names on the suspects list, Joel and Kelly, and Emily really couldn't see either of them as the compass stealer. She supposed one of the American group could have taken it right at the start of the tour. She wasn't sure how they would have known it was there, but she added Americans to her list, just to make it look a bit longer. Now, who else could have known about the compass, she wondered. She hadn't told a soul about it. Jack leapt backwards, knocking the notebook out of her hand. Cease fire, Emily yelled at the top of her voice. Scott, Jack and Drift all stopped playing and spun around. Emily tapped her pen on her notebook. We've got an investigation to run here, you know. Did either of you tell anyone about the Pendragon Compass? Scott, did you mention it to Drio Jarvis when you were hiring your equipment? Scott thought for a moment. No, I'm sure I didn't. I told him we were diving to the wreck of the mermaid, but nothing else. I was too busy trying on wetsuits. What about you, Jack? Emily asked. Nope, Jack said. Didn't breathe a word. Then he hesitated. Well, actually, I suppose I might have mentioned it to Mrs. White when I was at the farm. She asked me what you two were up to. Emily added the name Diana White to her list. You're joking, Jack laughed. Mrs. White's an old lady. She walks with a stick. She can't scuba dive. She said if God had meant us to swim underwater, he'd have given us gills. Emily shook her head. That could all be an elaborate cover story. Did you tell anyone else? She demanded. No, of course not, Jack retorted. Then he remembered something. Well, apart from Aunt Kate, when I was helping with the washing up last night, he glanced at Emily. Her pen was hovering over her notebook. You're not seriously going to put Aunt Kate on our list, are you? Jack could barely speak for laughing. Aunt Kate wrote soppy romantic novels for a living and was even older than Mrs. White. What, you think Aunt Kate has a secret past as a police frogman or a submarine captain? Emily smiled. Okay, I'll leave Aunt Kate off the list. She paused for a beat. For now. Is there anyone else you told, Scott asked Jack. Are you sure you didn't take a full page advert out in the Carrickstow Times? Jack stuck his tongue out at his brother. Emily read out her list of suspects. Joe Gordon, Kelly Mann, Americans, Mrs. White. That's all we've got. Apart from this, Jack pulled out the Scooby-Doo compass from his pocket. Scott clapped his hands over his eyes. I never went to see that stupid thing again. Emily took the compass and placed it inside one of the little plastic evidence bags she kept in her satchel. There was no point in looking for fingerprints on the compass, of course, as it had been found underwater. In fact, she realised, a shipwreck made a hopeless crime scene. No fingerprints, no footprints, no witnesses, no CCTV. Which all added up to the perfect crime. If you were the criminal. Join me for chapter 8.